Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about some of the important considerations that you need to keep in mind when taking care of patients in the PACU. Patients are admitted to the post-anesthesia care unit for transition from one-on-one -on -one monitoring in the operating room to a less acute monitoring on the floor or a no monitoring at home. There are several common disturbances and physiologic changes that occur with anesthesia, most common being post-operative nausea and vomiting with an incidence of about 10% followed by hypoxia, especially upper airway obstruction, cardiovascular instability, as well as hypothermia and shivering. And there's going to be a couple others that we're going to talk about. Another important thing to keep in mind is when you transport patients to the PACU, you should always pay attention to their respiratory efforts, either by watching the rise and fall of their chest wall, listening to their breath sounds, or even feeling their exhalation of the palm of your hand. Always transport patients on oxygen, with very rare exceptions as it was found that transporting patients on room air was the most important predictor of hypoxemia in the PACU. The PACU is staffed by nurses who are specially trained in recognizing post-operative or post-anesthesia complications. Um, upon patient arrival to the PACU, the anesthesiologist must give report to the nurse about patient current condition, any pre-existing conditions, the type of surgery, and the type of intervention that the patient received, including any medications. Throughout the patient's stay, uh, there's multiple parameters that must be monitored on a continuous basis. The respiratory parameters, such as airway patency, respiratory rate, um, oxygen saturation, must be continuously monitored. The cardiovascular parameters, heart rate, blood pressure, and um, electrocardiogram should be monitored as well. Additional things include neuromuscular blockade monitoring, if the patient received either non-depolarizing neuromuscular drugs or um, if the patient has neuromuscular disease, and then a periodic assessment of the patient's mental status, temperature, pain, and nausea vomiting must be conducted. The patient's hydration status, uh, either PO intake or their IV fluid intake, uh, must be monitored. And then uh, for some cases, uh, patient's urine output and then drainage and bleeding should be assessed periodically as well. Additionally, uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists developed um, the standards for post-anesthesia care. Um, this was developed by the Committee on Standards and Practice Parameters, um, and that gets periodically updated. This version here was last updated from uh, 2019, um, and you guys can read it on your own. But these are basically the bare minimum that must be done for every single patient. Some patients may require more monitoring than is listed, but this is just something that must be done for every single patient, no matter what kind of anesthesia they received. So let's talk a little bit about hypoxemia, which is one of the more common uh, physiologic disturbances in the PACU patient. The most common reasons for hypoxemia after surgery or anesthesia are atelectasis and alveolar hypoventilation. So alveolar hypoventilation occurs most commonly due to residual inhaled anesthetics opiates, or even neuromuscular blocking agents um, that the patient received intraoperatively. However, things like patients' pre-existing neuromuscular disease, as well as uh, things that are uh, particular to the patient's surgery, such as an abdominal binder or abdominal distension, they could also influence um, the patient's decreased ventilatory response post-op. So if you look at the alveolar gas equation, you can see that your PaO2 is dependent upon several variables listed over here. So FiO2 is one of those variables. Therefore, you can treat this alveolar hypoventilation by increasing FiO2, such as by providing patient with a nasal cannula of supplemental oxygen. However, as your PaCO2 increases, your PaO2 decreases, okay? Most of the time, it's not a significant increase in an awake patient. However, in a hypoventilating patient, if you double your entitled CO2 or arterial CO2, you know, let's say from 40 to 80, this can drop your PaO2 from 100 to, you know, about 50, which is a significant decrease. Um, so as your CO2 goes up, your PaO2 goes down. And in the PACU patient, uh, this can be pretty significant. So the way you treat it, like I said, you could either give them some oxygen or provide stimulation or even pharmacological reversal of sedation to stimulate their breathing. One of the other um, causes of hypoxemia in the PACU patient will be ventilation perfusion mismatch or shunt. So for ventilation perfusion mismatch, one of the common reasons for that is the decrease in your hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction from the residual anesthetic or even vasodilators that the patient may have received intraoperatively. This usually responds pretty well to supplemental oxygen. However, um, if a patient has a true shunt, 
uh, this will not always respond well to oxygen. So this, like I said, most commonly occurs from atelectasis. However, pulmonary edema, a pulmonary embolism, or even a pre-existing pneumonia can all impact that. To treat that, you would provide a patient with positive airway pressure, like just uh, applying a CPAP, for example, or providing them with a scent of spirometry, or even sitting the patient up in bed. Uh, the other uh, thing that sometimes occurs is increased venous admixture. This is more common in low cardiac output states. So normally only about 2 to 5% of cardiac output is shunted through the lungs. Um, however, in low cardiac output states, especially giving patients possible atelectasis, this shunt fraction can be increased and the blood that's returning to the heart is already severely deoxygenated. So this could actually impact the mixed venous, I'm sorry, mixed arterial blood and drop your PaO2. Finally, um, patients pre-existing decreased diffusion capacity, such as from their intrinsic lung disease that they had uh, preoperatively, can also impact um, their oxygen levels postoperatively. Upper air obstruction is one of the more common causes of hypoventilation in the PACU patient. The most common reason for obstruction is the loss of your normal pharyngeal tone. So in awake patients, pharyngeal muscles contract, thereby stenting the airways open whenever a negative pressure breath is generated. In a patient who lost their pharyngeal muscle tone due to residual anesthetic effects, the muscles collapse on each other, blocking the airway. So this results in a more negative force being generated by the lungs and more upper airway collapse in a vicious cycle. To treat this, most patients require jaw thrust or an oral or a nasal airway to uh, temporarily stent their airways open until they regain their tone. On some occasions, it may actually become necessary to apply positive air pressure, such as a CPAP. Obstructive sleep apnea is another common cause of upper air obstruction. Most people with uh, obstructive sleep apnea are not diagnosed um, at the time of their surgery, so you must always remain vigilant. If you do know a patient suffers from sleep apnea, it is prudent to wait to extubate them until they're fully awake and can follow commands. Patients with sleep apnea are sensitive to both opiates and benzodiazepines, which can significantly increase the incidence of upper air obstruction in those patients. Therefore, it's very important to try to provide a multimodal opiate sparing analgesia whenever it's not contraindicated. Patients with sleep apnea should also be placed in a head up position to assist with relieving some upper air obstruction. It is recommended that patients with sleep apnea bring their own CPAP uh, with them from home on a day of surgery so that it could be applied in the PACU and also ensure an adequate mask fit. Um, for those patients who are morbidly obese, it is actually recommended to extubate them directly to CPAP to improve their lung function. Residual neuromuscular blockade unfortunately continues to still be very common and you're very likely to encounter it in the PACU. It is reported in the literature that the incidence of this is 20 to 40 percent. Frequently, your patient will actually appear to be adequately strong and take good tidal volume breaths while um, on the ventilator, but upon extubation, when they're quietly resting in the PACU, their loss of pharyngeal tone will become quite apparent. So to ensure an adequate reversal of neuromuscular blockade, it's necessary to have a train of four ratio greater than 0.9, and that must be ensured objectively using a train of four monitor. Simply looking at the patient's twitches or even feeling them with your hand is uh, frequently misleading, and it cannot adequately assess complete reversal. Uh, we often rely on clinical signs of adequate patient reversal, such as sustained five-second head lift, grip strength, tongue protrusion, etc., but they are all unfortunately inferior to an objective train of four monitor. The best clinical sign for pharyngeal muscle reversal is the ability to hold on to a tongue depressor with the patient's teeth as you try to pull the tongue depressor out. However, again, I must emphasize that you always need to check patient reversal using an objective monitor for every patient who receives neuromuscular blocking agents. Some of the factors that can prolong the activity of neuromuscular blocking drugs include acidosis, hypothermia, and certain other medications, including inhaled anesthetics. Thankfully, Sagamidex has been game-changing in helping to provide complete recovery from neuromuscular blockade within several minutes. Hopefully, increasing use of this drug will help to decrease the incidence of neuromuscular blockade in the PACU. Laryngospasm most commonly occurs upon patient extubation while you're still in the operating room. However, it does occasionally happen in the PACU, especially those patients who were still asleep when they arrived. Laryngospasm is the spasm of the vocal cords and a closure of the laryngeal inlet with the epiglottis, which prevents patients from moving air. It is most likely to occur when you're extubating patients during stage two, which is when they're not completely awake, but yet not um, deep enough. Um, however, it can occur during any stage. It's usually triggered by airway irritation, such as from saliva or bleeding, or by painful stimuli. Uh, 
Um, the way to treat it is, of course, remove the triggering um, agent, such as suction of the saliva, uh, but you would immediately provide jaw thrust to the patient as well as apply some CPAP up to 40 centimeters of water. Um, depending on how much time you have and how quickly the patient's desaturating, if this is not enough, um, you can give a patient a little bit of propofol to try to deepen them and uh, relax the vocal cords. Um, if you do not have enough time, you should go ahead and just give succinylcholine, either IV, one milligram per kilogram, or IM, four milligrams per kilogram. Um, that would be followed by fully inducing the patient, give them some sort of sedation like propofol and tracheally intubate them. Another couple causes of upper airway obstruction include edema and hematoma. They do occur less frequently than the ones we just discussed. However, because they still occur, it's important to be aware of them. Edema is usually caused by steep Trendelenburg or prone positioning, especially in combination with excessive volume resuscitation. Traumatic intubation can exacerbate edema by causing inflammation at the site uh, and even more swelling. One way to check for upper airway edema would be to do a leak test, which is when you deflate the cuff of the ET tube and look for a leak. If there is no leak, that means that there's too much edema around the tube and it's important to leave the patient intubated until there is a leak and the swelling goes down. Some of the ways to improve edema would be to elevate the patient's head and improve their venous drainage. Make sure there's no um, nothing blocking the venous drainage, no dressings or no central lines, things like that. Um, you can also give the patient some diuretics or even some steroids to decrease the swelling. Hematomas usually occur um, in certain procedures, such as cervical spine procedures, thyroid or parathyroid procedures, or carotid surgeries. Uh, the symptoms of a hematoma would include pain at the site, a pressure sensation, and occasional dysphagia. Um, Hematomas can actually impair uh, your venous and lymphatic drainage, which would worsen your edema and exacerbate the problem. If you do encounter this uh, in the packet, this frequently can be an emergency. So as a temporizing measure, you can try to release the sutures um, and release the hematoma. And of course, you would immediately call the surgeon and an ENT. Um, at the same time, you would call for help and prepare for an emergency difficult intubation or even an awake intubation. So in summary, upper airway obstruction is something that must be addressed pretty quickly. So to begin, you should um, apply some jaw thrust and a little bit of CPAP, usually 15 centimeters of water is enough. If this is not enough, then uh, you may want to insert an oral or nasal airway or even an LMA if that is not enough. Then you should uh, try to figure out the cause of upper airway obstruction. Usually it's over sedation, um, sometimes residual effects of drugs like opiates or benzodiazepines um, can be the cause, um, in which case you may want to try some naloxone or flumazenil to reverse that. And of course, don't forget uh, neuromuscular blocking drug reversal if uh, that is something the patient received. If none of these interventions work, you may need to actually go ahead and intubate the patient. Although upper airway obstruction is the most common cause of hypoxia in the PACU, there could be other causes that you may need to address. Pulmonary edema is another frequently encountered reason for a low oxygen saturation. Postoperatively, the most common cause of pulmonary edema is cardiogenic in nature. Usually, it is from excessive volume administered during surgery, combined with patients' pre-existing cardiac conditions, such as congestive heart failure. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, as you have a multiple other lectures that address this in detail, but you would basically treat this as you would any patient with a CHF exacerbation, like diuretics, supportive treatment, etc. I would like to point out a couple of causes of pulmonary edema that are specific to the PACU. The first is post-obstructive or negative pressure pulmonary edema, which occurs when there is a forced inspiration against a closed glottis, such as during a laryngospasm. It is more common in strong, healthy people with good lung functions. When the patient generates negative pressure during inspiration, but is unable to inhale, the resulting intrathoracic pressure increases blood flow to the right heart which in turn increases the hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary vasculature and causes extravasation of the fluid into the alveoli and the interstitium. This negative intrathoracic pressure will also increase the left ventricular afterload, which decreases your ejection fraction, and then causes increased left ventricular diastolic pressure, left atrial pressure, and pulmonary vascular pressure, which exacerbates this problem. The symptoms of negative pressure pulmonary edema include hypoxemia, dyspnea, pink frothy sputum, and then bilateral fluffy infiltrates on chest x-ray.
Treatment is supportive with oxygen and occasionally diuretic and positive pressure ventilation. This condition usually resolves in 12 to 48 hours. Transfusion-related pulmonary edema is also something you may encounter in a post-surgical patient. Transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley, and transfusion-related circulatory overload, or TACO, are two of those causes. If a patient received blood products during the procedure, both of these should be on your differential diagnosis of pulmonary edema. In trolley, recipient neutrophils become activated by constituents of the donor blood product. These neutrophils then release inflammatory mediators that injure the lung and cause inflammation, which leads to increased permeability and edema. Transfusion-related circulatory overload, however, usually occurs in patients with pre-existing cardiac conditions, such as CHF, where the excess volume administered in the form of blood products causes fluid overload and cardiac dysfunction. Patients will frequently be hypertensive and show signs of cardiogenic cause of edema, such as an elevated BNP. Treatment for both of these is supportive with oxygen and diuresis. Let's talk a little bit about oxygen supplementation. It's currently recommended that every patient receive oxygen supplementation during transport to the PACU as well as during their stay. While arguments have been made to decrease oxygen supplementation in order to save cost, studies have found um, the benefits of providing oxygen and avoiding hypoxia greatly outweigh the costs. The one caveat is that when you do provide oxygen and avoid hypoxia, pulse oximetry becomes inadequate in monitoring ventilation. So if the patient is on room air, their desaturation will usually correlate with their decrease in ventilation. However, with an external oxygen source, it is easy to miss this. So it's therefore vitally important to observe the patient's respirations and if needed, monitor their blood gases. The most common ways of oxygen delivery in the PACU include face mask or face stent, nasal cannula, or blow-by oxygen. Frequently, patient demographics or the nature of their procedure will determine which methods are used. For example, a patient after neck surgery with fresh sutures may not be a good candidate for a face stent due to pressure created on the suture line. Alternatively, a patient after nasal surgery would not be a good candidate for a nasal cannula. Pediatric patients often require blow-by oxygen as it is the least invasive method. A regular face mask requires at least a 5 liter of minute flow to prevent rebreathing of CO2. Alternatively, you may use a non-rebreather mask, which would also provide the highest concentration of oxygen, up to 95%, and spontaneously ventilating patients. If you do use a traditional nasal cannula, it is recommended to use a maximum flow of about 6 liters per minute, which is equivalent to an FiO2 of about 44%, to ensure patient comfort. Even then, however, it is recommended that the oxygen is humidified to prevent excess drying of mucous membranes. If the patient requires additional oxygen support, a high-flow nasal cannula may be used. A high-flow nasal cannula can provide flows of up to 60 liters a minute of humidified and warmed oxygen. It is delivered directly to the nasopharynx and has an added CPAP effect due to the higher flows. Continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP, is another good way to deliver oxygen. It is especially useful in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. It improves irreversible hypoxemia from atelectasis, hyperventilation, and volume overload by recruiting alveoli. Sometimes, even despite the application of CPAP, patients require further ventilatory support. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is a good alternative to intubation in those cases. It can be delivered either via biphasic positive airway pressure or BiPAP machine using a face mask or a nasal cannula, or it can be provided using a ventilator mask with a pressure support mode. This method, however, is contraindicated in patients with hemodynamic instability, altered mental status, high risk of aspiration, and certain surgical procedures, such as esophageal surgery. Additionally, if the patient is suffering from refractory hypoxemia, then endotracheal intubation may become necessary. Another common disturbance in the PACU that is frequently seen is cardiovascular instability. That includes hypotension, hypertension, various types of arrhythmias, and ischemia. And interestingly, hypertension and tachycardia are actually associated with a higher mortality and a risk of ICU admission than hypotension. Hypotension can be divided into hypovolemic, distributive, cardiogenic, and extracardiac obstructive. Hypovolemic hypotension occurs due to decreased preload. Most commonly, it's due to third spacing and inadequate resuscitation during long surgeries, which leads to a decrease in circulating blood volume. It can also be due to an effective decrease in intravascular volume from vasodilation that's caused by neuraxial anesthesia.
Bleeding is another common cause of hypovolemia in a post-surgical patient and should always be on your radar. These patients will present with hypotension and tachycardia, although if they are taking beta blockers, they may not exhibit the tachycardia, and that's something to be aware of. The urine output will be decreased, and in severe cases, patients may also develop an altered mental status. Local anesthetic systemic toxicity, or LAST, can also manifest as hypovolemic hypotension in the PACU. It results from accidental intravascular injection or rapid absorption of local anesthetic. You will learn more about this in your local anesthetics lecture, but keep in mind the symptoms include central nervous system manifestations such as tinnitus, altered mental status, and seizures. Treatment should be promptly initiated and includes benzodiazepines for seizures and intralipid 20% solution, 1.5 milliliters per kilogram over one minute and then 0.25 milliliters per kilogram for 30 minutes. Supportive treatment should also be provided and include supplemental oxygen and frequently endotracheal intubation. Distributive hypotension results from a decrease in afterload. Neuraxial anesthesia may be a cause due to its vasodilatory effects like I already mentioned, but other causes include critically ill patients who rely on constant sympathetic tone to maintain their afterload, who lose that sympathetic tone due to the effects of anesthesia. Anaphylaxis is something you must be able to quickly recognize and treat, and it occasionally occurs in the PACU. Something to keep in mind is that anaphylaxis and anaphylactoid reactions do not always occur immediately after exposure to a triggering agent. It may occur when the patient arrives in the PACU after having received a drug in the operating room. Symptoms of anaphylaxis include hypotension, rash or hives, bronchospasm, and facial edema. Patient tryptase levels will be elevated as well and should be drawn within 30 hours of the observed reaction. However, this is done more for um, confirmatory reasons rather than for diagnosis, as the results uh, usually take several days to come back. Immediate treatment should be instituted in cases of suspected anaphylaxis and include epinephrine, steroids, and H1, H2 blockers, as well as fluids and vasopressors as needed. Of course, it goes without saying, if the patient reacted to something you're administering, then you should immediately remove the offending agent. Finally, sepsis should also be in your deferential diagnosis for hypotension and is more common after urinary and biliary tract procedures. If sepsis is suspected, blood cultures must be drawn and empiric antibiotics started. Fluids and pressors should be administered as needed, with drug of choice being norepinephrine. Vasopressin may also be added as needed. Cardiogenic hypotension is due to intrinsic pump failure. It is basically cardiogenic shock from cardiac ischemia infarction, cardiac tamponade, cardiomyopathy exacerbation, and arrhythmia. To help with diagnosis, it may be useful to monitor the patient's central venous pressure and use an echocardiogram or even a PA catheter. This type of hypotension shows relative hypervolemia, as evidenced by distended neck veins, elevated CVP, and pulmonary edema. Unfortunately, cardiogenic shock carries a pretty high mortality of up to 70%. Patients may require an intra-aortic balloon pump, a heart cath, or even an emergency cardiac surgery if this occurs. Obstructive or extracardiac hypotension is basically due to decreased venous return. This is similar to hypovolemia, but in this case, the decrease in preload occurs due to impairment of diastolic filling from obstruction. Some examples of this include cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, a vena cava compression, such as from a tumor, constrictive pericarditis, pulmonary embolism, or even a high PEEP. To treat this type of hypotension, you must treat the underlying cause. Hypertension is another hemodynamic disturbance that you frequently encounter in the PACU. Patients with essential hypertension are most at risk, especially if they didn't take their morning medication dose. Other risk factors include pain, nausea, vomiting, hypoventilation and resulting hypercapnia, emergence excitement, anxiety or agitation, advanced age, urinary retention, and renal disease. Additionally, drug influence or withdrawal, such as alcohol withdrawal, can be the cause. Surgeries that are highest risk for postoperative hypertension include carotid and intracranial surgeries. To correct the hypertension, you must treat the cause, and in some cases, provide pharmacologic blood pressure control. Myocardial infarction is the most common perioperative cause of cardiac-related mortality. It is frequently not accompanied by chest pain in the PACU due to residual analgesia. If a patient does complain of chest pain, it is recommended that a 12-lead EKG is obtained and serial troponins are drawn. An exam should be conducted to rule out other causes of chest pain, such as a pneumothorax or esophageal rupture. The American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology guidelines suggest that you should obtain troponin levels for any patient showing EKG signs suggestive of ischemia. Even in patients without myocardial infarction, elevated troponin levels are associated with poor outcomes. 
Once mycardial ischemia is diagnosed, the surgeon should be notified and a cardiology consult should be obtained. The patient should be given oxygen and blood pressure and heart rate should be controlled. If there are no contraindications, the patient should also be given nitroglycerin, a beta blocker, an aspirin, and a statin. The pain and anxiety should also be treated and anemia should be corrected so as to avoid demand ischemia. Any further interventions such as a PCI should be discussed with the surgeon, cardiologist, and the patient. Perioperative arrhythmias are frequently transient and reversible and include tachycardia, bradycardia, atrial arrhythmias, and ventricular arrhythmias. Tachycardia in the PACU is frequently caused by pain, agitation, hypoxia or hypercapnia, hypovolemia, nausea, and shivering. However, more serious, although less common causes include hemorrhage, shock, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, thyroid storm, or malignant hyperthermia. If the patient is stable, you should give the patient oxygen and then perform a 12-lead EKG to determine the underlying rhythm. You would then seek to treat the underlying cause. If the patient is unstable, usually with heart rates above 150, and is showing signs of hypotension, shock, or altered mental status, then immediate electrical synchronized cardioversion should be performed. Bradycardia is most commonly iatrogenic, for example, from administration of beta blockers or dexmedetomidine. However, patient factors such as post-surgical bowel distension, elevated intracranial pressure, or even sympathectomy from a high spinal could all cause bradycardia. If the bradycardia is stable, frequently no treatment is necessary. However, if the patient becomes unstable and perfusion is compromised, they should be treated with atropine as the first-line drug. Occasionally, transcutaneous pacing or even inotropes such as dopamine or epinephrine may become necessary. The most common atrial arrhythmia encountered in the PACU is atrial fibrillation, uh, with an incidence of about 4% following major non-cardiac surgery. The incidence is even higher after cardiac and thoracic procedures, where it can be triggered by direct cardiac irritation. Other contributing factors include pre-existing cardiac disease, volume overload, electrolyte disturbances, and hypoxia. Treatment focuses on ventricular rate control. It can usually be achieved with beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Occasionally, chemical cardioversion with amiodarone may be needed. If the patient is unstable, electrical cardioversion must be performed right away. The most common ventricular arrhythmias following surgery include premature ventricular contractions and vigemony, which frequently resolve on their own and resolve, uh, result from increased sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Treatment should be focused on alleviating pain and agitation, as well as avoiding hypercapnia. Another ventricular arrhythmia that can be seen in the postoperative period is torsades, which can be caused by the administration of QT prolonging drugs in patients with pre existing long QT. Treatment in this case is administering magnesium, 1 to 2 grams IV. Postoperative nausea and vomiting, or PONV, is a significant issue frequently encountered in the PACU and can sometimes be more bothersome to the patient than even pain. It can also increase aspiration risk and prolong PACU stays, so prevention and treatment are very important. It is estimated that without any prevention, about a third of patients will develop nausea and vomiting after general anesthesia. Risk factors that increase the incidence of PONV include female sex, non-smoker, history of previous PONV or motion sickness, and postoperative opioid administration. Younger individuals under 50 years of age are more susceptible than older individuals. The likelihood of PONV increases with each additional risk factor, with zero risk factors having a 10% risk and all four factors having an 80% risk. It is suggested that each risk factor warrants one antiemetic prophylactic medication, so the more risk factors a patient has, the more prophylactic agents they should receive. This chart on the right shows some of the classes of antiemetic drugs and some examples from each class. It is recommended that the same class of medication not be redosed within six hours, and some, like scopolamine, a prepotent, and dexamethasone, should not be redosed at all. It should be noted that metoclopramide, a prokinetic, should be avoided in patients with a possibility of gastric obstruction. Intraoperatively, replacing volatile agents with propofol and avoiding the use of nitrous oxide are some other things that you can do to reduce the incidence of PONV. Postoperative shivering with or without hypothermia can be another problem frequently encountered in the PACU. Postop hypothermia is defined as core temperature less than 36 degrees Celsius and can occur after general and neuraxial anesthesia. It is frequently accompanied by shivering, but shivering can also occur by itself in a normothermic patient. The reasons that hypothermia and shivering are concerning include increased oxygen consumption, CO2 production, and sympathetic tone. This, in turn, can lead to increased heart rate, blood pressure, and cardiac output, as well as increased intraocular pressure, which can be an issue after eye surgeries.
Of course, if hypothermia is allowed to progress, it can lead to further issues, such as increased coagulopathy, prolonged neuromuscular blockade, and delayed awakening. In fact, if your patient is being slow to wake up, you must make sure that they're normothermic first. The mechanism behind postoperative shivering in a normothermic patient is thought to be related to the relatively slower awakening of the brain compared to the spinal cord, which results in uninhibited activity of the spinal reflexes and clonus. The receptors involved appear to be kappa opioid, NMDA, and 5-HT receptors. The best treatment for hypothermia is a forced air warmer, while meperidine is the drug of choice for postoperative shivering. Renal dysfunction is something else that you may encounter in the PACU patients. Oliguria is defined as urine output less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour and can have prerenal, intrarenal, and postrenal etiologies. In the PACU, you should focus on identifying any readily reversible causes, such as a kinked or dislodged Foley catheter, which are often overlooked. However, acute kidney injury is also not uncommon in the postoperative setting. Some patient risk factors for AKI include a history of pre-existing renal insufficiency or CKD, diabetes, hypertension, morbid obesity, history of steroid use, male sex, and old age. Procedures that are most likely to cause AKI include cardiac surgeries, emergency surgeries, and any type of major surgery such as vascular or transplant surgery. The key in decreasing the chances of developing postoperative AKI is to focus on modifiable risk factors, such as appropriate fluid management in the OR. The patient's circulating blood volume must be maintained with adequate IV fluid resuscitation, which would ensure proper renal perfusion. Additionally, patient's blood pressure must be maintained at an appropriate level, usually above MAP of 60, but possibly higher in patients with chronic hypertension. This should be continued in the PACU. Vasopressors can be employed if necessary, but dopamine and vasodilators are not currently recommended for renal protection. Besides AKI, several other things can cause oliguria in the PACU. The most common cause is intravascular volume depletion. To determine if this is the cause, it is useful to do a fluid bolus challenge to see if patient's urine output improves after fluid administration. A complete blood count should be drawn to check for ongoing bleeding as a possible reason behind hypovolemia, and the mean arterial pressure should be maintained at an adequate level to ensure that the decreased kidney perfusion due to hypotension is not the reason behind the oliguria. If a fluid challenge is contraindicated, then fractional excretion of sodium or an echocardiogram could be used to determine volume status. Postoperative urinary retention is defined as greater than 600 milliliters of urine in the bladder without the ability to void within 30 minutes. To diagnose it, a bladder ultrasound is useful and can be performed at bedside. Treatment includes in and out catheter or anchoring a Foley catheter. Intraabdominal hypertension should be considered in patients presenting with a tense abdomen after abdominal surgery. It is defined as intraabdominal pressure greater than 12. Normal intraabdominal pressure is about 5 millimeters of mercury. If intraabdominal pressure reaches over 25 millimeters of mercury, it becomes abdominal compartment syndrome. This results in end organ dysfunction, including renal impairment, due to renal vein compression. To measure interabdominal pressure, you can use the patient's bladder pressure, which should be measured at the end of exhalation. Rhabdomyolysis is most common after crush or burn injuries, so major trauma surgery patients are at risk. Morbidly obese patients undergoing bariatric surgery are the other group of patients at risk for rhabdomyolysis. Signs and symptoms include myoglobinuria and elevated creatinine kinase. Treatment is early and aggressive hydration to prevent myoglobin and heme casts from causing tubular obstruction and renal toxicity. Occasionally, continuous renal replacement therapy may be necessary to help remove circulating myoglobin. Contrast nephropathy should also be considered in patients who undergo angiography, such as during endovascular procedures for stent placement. Adequate perioperative hydration is key in preventing its occurrence. Postoperative delirium is defined as acute and fluctuating alteration of mental state of reduced awareness and disturbance of attention. It can occur up to five days after surgery, but is frequently already present in the PACU. Risk factors for postoperative delirium include age greater than 65, cognitive impairment, severe illness or comorbidity burden, hearing or vision impairment, or presence of infection. The surgery acts as a stressor that precipitates delirium. To avoid delirium, prevention is key. Some things that could help prevent delirium include frequently reorienting the patient, providing glasses, hearing aids for sensory enhancement, maintaining circadian rhythms, adequate pain control, and avoiding deliriogenic medications.
If those interventions are insufficient, you should evaluate possible underlying causes such as infection, like UTI or pneumonia, electrolyte abnormalities, uh, medication effects, etc. Treating underlying causes of delirium and non-pharmacologic intervention should always be the mainstay of treatment. But in severe cases, especially those complicated by agitation, low-dose Haldol or atypical antipsychotics can be used. Emergence excitement, on the other hand, is a transient, confused state associated with emergence from general anesthesia. It is more common in children, especially ages 2 through 4, and occurs within 10 minutes of emergence from anesthesia. It is short-lasting and resolves quickly on its own. It appears to be associated uh, with quick emergence from anesthesia and the use of sebafluorine gas, although data is unclear. Additionally, perioperative stress and anxiety as well as pain are seen as contributing factors, so preventing and treating those things seems to help reduce the incidence of emergence excitement. Premedication with midazolam, dexmedetomidine, and fentanyl appears to be beneficial as well. Even after long surgery, awakening should occur within 60 to 90 minutes. If this doesn't happen, causes of delayed awakening should be assessed. The most common reason for this is residual drug effects, with most common drugs being benzodiazepines, opiates, and neuromuscular blocking drugs. After long cases, propofol and volatile agents may also be the culprit. Acute alcohol and illegal drug intoxication should also be considered, especially for patients who require emergency surgery. Finally, central anticholinergic syndrome occurs when multiple anticholinergic drugs combine to block cholinergic neurotransmission in the brain and cause delayed wake-up. This is also something that should be considered in a patient who received multiple anticholinergic drugs. Metabolic disturbances such as hyponatremia as well as metabolic diseases like liver disease can all contribute to de delayed awakening. Finally, neurologic events such as seizures, stroke, or elevated intracranial pressure could also be the cause. Your approach to treatment should begin with assessing the airway, breathing, and circulation, as well as ensuring normothermia. Any possible residual agents should be discontinued. For example, anything left in the patient's IV tubing should be flushed out. A cardiopulmonary and neurological exam, including pupil reflexes, should be performed. A train of four monitor should be used to check for residual neuromuscular blockade, which should be reversed. Possible residual opioid and benzodiazepine effects should be reversed with naloxone and flamazonil, respectively. You should also check glucose and correct if necessary. Obtaining an ABG is helpful for correcting any electrolyte abnormalities and identifying possible CO2 narcosis, which can be treated with hyperventilation and even possibly reintubation of the patient. Like I mentioned, central anticholinergic syndrome should also be considered and can be treated with physostigmine. Finally, a head CT as well as a neurology consult should be obtained if none of the other interventions work, and the patient should be admitted to the ICU for further monitoring. Corneal abrasions are the most common type of eye injury encountered in the PACU and are caused by mechanical trauma. Risk factors include general anesthesia, prone or Trendelenburg positioning, taped eyes, and oxygen supplementation during transport. Patients usually present with blurry vision, foreign body sensation, tearing, redness, and photophobia. It usually resolves on its own and is short-lived, but for comfort, patients may be offered some saline flushes and warm or cool compresses. Ophthalmology consults are not usually necessary. Other causes of vision loss that are much more rare but much more devastating include ischemic optic neuropathy, cerebral vision loss, and central retinal artery occlusion. Risk factors for ischemic optic neuropathy include male sex, obesity, prone positioning, long surgery that's greater than 6.5 hours, and blood loss greater than 45% of blood volume. Ophthalmology consults should be obtained in those cases but the prognosis is usually poor and vision loss is usually permanent. PACU discharge criteria often seem to be very vague, and this is probably due to the fact that there are no specific criteria that must absolutely be met. There's no mandatory amount of time that a patient must remain in the PACU, but in general, that must be observed until they are not at risk for ventilatory depression and their mental status is returned to baseline. To aid in determining when is it safe to discharge a patient, several scoring systems have been designed and modified over the years. The most current one is the post-anesthesia discharge scoring system and gives a score of 0 to 2 points to five different variables. A score of at least 9 is deemed adequate for discharge. These variables include vital signs, where a score of 2 means the vitals are within 20% of baseline, score of 1 means they're within 20 to 40% of baseline, and score of 0 means they're within more than 40% of baseline. Activity level is given two points if a patient has a steady gait and does not require assistance ambulating. One requires assistance and zero unable to ambulate. Nausea and vomiting is another important variable and is a frequent cause of delayed PACU stays. Two means none or minimal nausea. One is moderate nausea and zero is severe nausea not responding to interventions.
Pain is the most common cause of delayed pachystase, especially in the ambulatory setting, and gets two points if it's an acceptable and two if it's an unacceptable pain level. Finally, surgical bleeding gets two points if it's minimal and requires no dressing changes, one point if it's moderate and requires up to two dressing changes, and zero points if it's severe with more than three dressing changes. The ability to void is no longer considered a requirement for PACU discharge. So this is it. Here's some of my references, and I hope you guys learned something. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a good day.